Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by PC, Pocket Computer. PC, you ask? Personal computer? No. No one uses any of those anymore with phones, phablets, tablets, twos and ones, and laptops. Uh, well, the Pocket Computer is all of those and none of those. It's an AI in your pocket and in your ear. Pocket Computer is constantly listening and remembering. Hey, do you remember what we're doing on Friday? No, you don't. But PC does. It lets you know instantaneously. Do you need to, uh, help speaking with someone in another ang- language? Well, PC translates their speech and tells you how to speak back to them. Who needs a brain in your head when you have a, one in your pocket? The PC. Pocket There's computer. Brain in my brain. I'm feeling your pain. Everybody thinks I'm insane, but I'm just on my game. Almost everyone is afraid of something, and almost everyone has had a frightening experience. Of all the emotions we experience, none feel quite as primordial as the breath-catching, heart rate-rocketing, muscle-tensing moment of fear. In today's show, I talked to Yannick Villanueva, who is researching the brain and its role in fears and phobias. decision-making phobias yeah I haven't gone too much into the decision-making of it and uh, what I've learned in my past classes but yeah kind of just the general neuroscience of it and what's happening in the brain mm-hmm. oh, well can you tell me how you got interested in your topic uh, so like I said I took a psychology of judgment and decision-making class and we talked about this uh, dread risk which is kind of like when people like decide not to fly after 9-11 because even though the risk is like so tiny that the plane is going to go down, people just overestimated it. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. And then at the same time, I have like, I have like some serious trypophobia, which is the fear of clustered holes, which like makes me just cringe every time I see him. So like I figured, you know, fear would be a pretty interesting uh, topic. Yeah, and, and do you think that fear or negative emotions are things that play a larger role in our life than positive emotions? I would say yeah, probably. Uh, just because it just seems like um, you know there's just a more there's just a stronger reaction to kind of negative things. You know, fear can be like it can cause it causes such strong physiological responses for m- most kind of. Uh, uh, symptoms of fear, like any kind of level of fear. Meanwhile, like more positive emotions are a little more subtle, how uh, they act. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and can, jumping into the brain, then, uh, what are the parts of the brain that are involved in fear and, and those physiological responses? Yeah, uh, so the main one is uh, the amygdala, which is the one that's been probably the most researched, and um, but and that's mostly due to a certain patient, patient SM, who actually had lesions with the in the amygdala, but there's been uh, a lot more research done on, I think it's the FAI, I I have to like kind of keep notes about what they are, so I forget, them, but the thing is like, it was, I forgot exactly where, but there's like this whole way, there's two different methods that interacts in the brain, that's fear perception and fear and experiencing fear, and there's like two different pathways, so a lot of different things going on there, a lot of moving parts, but the amygdala does play a very large role in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what about uh, most interesting findings you found in your research so far? Uh, I think what would mostly be uh, with the patient that I was talking about would be just kind of how there's more to like emotions and fear than you would think other than the fight or flight response. It's not just that in um, at least the amygdala. Um, has a very big is like very important in kind of social learning and like understanding like how close to how close to stand to someone before it just gets awkward and, and like you know there's just a whole array of different social perceptual things that fear has a role in that <clears throat> I would say a lot of people don't know and it's actually really interesting. Yeah I saw in your uh, BuzzFeed article there was the graph showing how close SM was willing to uh, like consider her personal space. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that was the one because I felt like it was 
it's the funniest thing. You would never think that like fear and emotion would like play as big of a role as it does in just talking to people and interacting with people. <laughs> yeah, I, I can. I said a third of a meter, so basically a foot away. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was like she's right up in there, and it's just I I just can't imagine it. I've, I know people who stand close, but that was just like okay. <laughs> This person you just take a step back, she takes a step forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did you see anything about, uh, like, how she looks at people's faces? Um, it, I, from what I remember, it's something like she just can't read, like, different emotions on faces. So if someone, uh, so if someone's, like, feeling fear, she can't, like, see that. She just says, oh, yeah, that's a face. Mm -hmm. that's, okay. That's yeah. Just, I was thinking some of the uh, cool research is they just show pictures of people's eyes and like fearful eyes are the ones where you see like yeah. the whites of their eyes and yeah you show her that and she's like well, I don't know well, those are eyes <laughs> yeah. but she can see like happiness like the crinkled corners of the eyes and those kinds of things so yeah. uh, how the amygdala drives our ability to look at other people's faces and know what they're feeling yeah I mean like from what I remember is the amygdala is kind of like the centerpiece in that like maybe not the beginning of what happens when people experience or see fear but rather it's right in the middle and it's like it doesn't necessarily drive the whole process but it's necessary everything needs to go through it and so I think that was really interesting how it kind of uh, develops and like how people actually act without an amygdala mm -hmm. And maybe jumping from people without an amygdala to maybe people with overactive amygdalas, uh, have you found anything in terms of uh, the amygdala and phobias? I haven't found that too much. Uh, a lot of the research is mostly, like at least late, lately, has been about kind of like the exact circuits of like uh, fear, like conditioning, as well as extinction. So when people don't like start to be scared of a certain phobia, and so. That, I think that a lot of that has been driven by like disorders like PTSD and like the and other things that um, they want to try to help people and like that's kind of one of the big kind of uh, uh, overarching goals of psychology and neuroscience is to try and help people that have serious conditions. Mm -hmm. Have you kind of looked forward to any um, potential therapies, maybe brain-based therapies for helping people with phobias or fear? Uh, as far as brain-based, there hasn't been, um, not that I remember anything that's been well-researched other than, you know, uh, beha like just general behavioral therapy, so like talking to people. Like, it <laughs> seems really funny that you do all this research and you find out just talking to people and like these simple things that people do are actually some of the most helpful and like one of the best remedies for illnesses like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going back to SM, uh, one of kind of the most common fears is like fears of snakes and spiders, and if you ask SM uh, what she's afraid of, she'll actually tell you that she's afraid of snakes and spiders. Yeah. And then you take her to a, a pet store and uh, show her the pet snakes and the pet spiders, and she sticks her hand in the container and they crawl on her, and she like displays no fear. Yeah. Uh, even though she like is able to say that she should be afraid of those things. Yeah, and that that's one of the interesting parts is like one of the genetic component in that there's. You know, there's definite evolutionary factors that are going on. Uh, you know, I, no one, like even people who I remember, they were, uh, they did a study about people. Uh, it was like some nomadic tribe in Namibia, or some basically out of Western culture, out of all of this. That like, if you describe them, you know, person seeing a big uh, animal that they are experiencing fear. So the, it, there is a serious like genetic component that there are some fears that are ingrained within us that you know, they, it's everywhere. Yeah, I, I always um, know my amygdala is working when I'm walking around at night and I feel like I see like a spider or something like that and my heart rate yeah. just starts racing and I'm like, oh, okay, so my, my amygdala is still working. Yeah. Uh, are, how about, any, are there any more like 21st century fears or phobias? So we're talking about like snakes and bears and uh, <laughs> those kind of things. Uh, and you were saying that the amygdala and fear is really important for social interaction. So I wonder if there's any kind of 21st century new fears that are developing. Uh, well, I mean, one of the biggest ones that uh, people talk about is social anxiety and like just fear of people, generalized fear of people is like, 
uh, it's becoming really big, especially now that where it's impossible to go about your life, or for the most part, without being like talking to people all the time and like being around people all the time. I mean, we have seven billion, eight billion people now. It's like that they're everywhere. So you, social anxiety is like probably one of the biggest things that comes up. But I mean, you can. S- look up 12 weirdest fears online and you get weird things like people afraid of taking baths people afraid of the workplace is one of them you know these really funny things but you know like they can cause serious reactions in people and it's pretty it's pretty interesting that Mm -hmm. and do you think that there's any kind of confusing aspect of uh, fear or phobias uh, for the public uh i would say would be uh kind of understanding that there's two very different ways that fear like the going back to the two circuit thing and that perceiving fear and seeing people like seeing fear in other people and you know and then actually experiencing fear those two are very very different things and they they work in different ways in the brain and produce different reactions i think uh at least until we have a firmer understanding of uh like exactly how it happens uh especially in the real world is you know one of the things that at least has got me confused because i keep because uh between perception and experience that's a very fine line whether it's uh you know seeing fear on other people's faces and whatnot Mm -hmm. uh and let's see here so going forward do you think there's anything new or interesting uh in this area of, of fears or phobias i would say it's definitely uh kind of those 21st century fears like seeing how more of the real world uh, conditioning happens because uh, you, you know right now the research is all in the lab and you know and it's all in the laboratory or it's about this patient SM or these studies but like you know most people don't have these lesions and so seeing exactly how like people really develop this social anxiety and why two people that seem almost identical and one may become uh, one may develop this fear while the other one doesn't I think kind of seeing uh, getting a more real life kind of understanding of how fear works would be is probably like next big step that would be yeah it def- definitely seems complicated a lot of the f- I think older fear work was the fear conditioning work that you talked about like the shock of rat in a certain context and then they become afraid of that context or uh, you blow a loud noise in their ear and they're scared of, yeah. um, of something <laughs> but how do these like more uh, like how do I become afraid of school or how do I develop test anxiety or these other things is it really just one test uh, I mean that's the thing is we really don't know but I mean from what we've understood is that there's a serious cultural component and because there's this perception of fear like being able to see like not necessarily fear but maybe distress or something on another person's face while taking the test really ingrains that into you and then you know if that happens all the time you know, it makes sense it just kind of makes sense that you just ha- are terrified of these tests and seeing how like there's possible remedies for that would definitely also have a lot of social implications I think mm-hmm. all right well do you think there's any one last uh, really important thing that you want to mention or communicate about your research uh i would say uh just the biggest thing is to understand that like fear isn't just you know fight or flight it 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 plays a role in humans as social creatures and you know this there's a very uh, there's actually one large uh paper about emotions in real life that they're real that it's there's this it's very much fear except uh and social and society and how it develops are very closely intertwined and you know it's all it's almost all about context is really what it is well real thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing uh, your research that uh, you've pursued so far i really enjoyed the uh, buzzfeed article how phobias <laughs> hack your brain you can find <laughs> on community uh, buzzfeed uh let's see anything you like to promote uh, to anyone uh well if you see my <laughs> article i definitely uh definitely try and check it out it's there's a there's there's a healthy skepticism that should be involved with any uh buzzfeed uh science article but i was i i'm pretty confident that this is one of the better ones oh good and, and where do you fall on the gif gif uh 
Why? Uh, I would say it's more of a gif. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I ask me tomorrow. I might say gif. Yeah. <laughs> I go back and forth too. And then any anything that you found interesting lately, fad product, um, and just anything in general. Uh, I mean, Apple just released a new iPhone SE six, which is basically an iPhone five with a six engine which doesn't really make sense to me, but, uh, peop, you know, I'm more of a Microsoft guy, so I don't understand these Apple people. <laughs> All right, well, again, thank you so much. Many thanks go out to Yannick for coming in and uh, speaking with me today. Uh, in the last two segments of the show, I'm looking for uh, Jake's Jams. Uh, these are things I've been digging lately uh, and uh, things I uh, have been really liking. Uh, just recently, Twitter celebrated its 10 years, and uh, I've been using Twitter for the last couple of years and really enjoy seeing what uh, my colleagues are doing and seeing what uh, other interesting things people share uh, on Twitter. And I also like uh, trying to reach out to people on Twitter. Uh, so that's something I've been uh, jamming for a long time. Uh, the last part uh, for the future uh, will be um, reader mail or reader tweets. Uh, you can tweet me at engagebrain. Uh, and Twitter. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, email me. It's my last name at uh, gmail.com uh, with any questions that I'll try to answer in uh, this last part of the show. Uh, so thank you.